Okay. All right, 22, we're ready. Yep. Welcome to the Hampton Beach Village District Monthly Meeting. It is January 20th, 2016. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we start the meeting, I wanted to take a moment of silence. Uh, we, we've just recently lost three uh, Village District um, family members, because uh, I think we're all a big family in this town. So. Um, I'd like to take a moment of silence for Dee Shavaris. Nick, and uh, Dee is uh, also uh, Commissioner Buckley's sister-in-law. Nick Jace, who's a neighbor of mine. And Doc Janice, who's been a, a member for a long time. So we'll take a moment of silence, please. Thank you. a really busy meeting. I'm going to start with Kathleen Murphy. She's superintendent of the SAU 90 and she's going to tell us all about uh, the proposal for the new school and see what we can uh, get the word out in the village district uh, and hopefully it'll pass for you. Right, and I brought with me tonight Nathan Money, who is the assistant superintendent in Hampton and for business and uh, Tell me how much time we have, Mr. H, so we, we can, because you have the busy schedule, and we were very pleased that you would take some time for us tonight, so. <laughs> yeah, I have to be careful of him. Well, I think just kind of if you give us a an overview an overview of everything, we don't need to know the exact details, because I know the budget committee and the town and selectmen right. and stuff like that, but just what's going on, what we can do. I'll give you a quick overview. Mm -hmm. um, we actually brought some, some, some diagrams, Nate will set those up, but I'll get started right away. Just give you a little bit of an overview about the project. And um, uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank and you. Um, we haven't been down um, to, to your meeting, Nathan and I, so the opportunity that was given to us by Steve and Bob, we grabbed it because we haven't been down here. And although we have lots of kids down here, and we're down here with the kids, um, but we, we haven't really done this this part of it, so we appreciate it. But you know, since, uh, oh, since 1996, the town of Hampton has been looking at the middle school, uh, trying to determine what kinds of things that they should do to it. Uh, and why? You say why? Well, 19, the, the building is 1939, the first original building. Uh, the second is 1965. And then the third section is a wing that they put on uh, in 1975. So as you, as you can imagine, with four, 500, 600 people going through a building every day, it, it takes a beating. They haven't really done um, any major changes to that building in all that time. Um, we're, we're very pleased, Mr. Lassard, I don't know if you know Keith Lassard, our, our, our facilities director, he's awesome, and he's been able to keep that building, it, it, he does, it, it looks beautiful. Um, outside is, is pristine, but inside we really have some issues that we need to deal with. So I think we'll, we'll touch upon those a little bit tonight. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over some of the basic things that we need to do, and Nate's just going to talk real quick about the money because that's always on everybody's lips, right? So um, we'll, we'll do that as quickly as we can. Um, we are proposing a comprehensive middle school at a cost of $24,945,000. And we know that's a large, that's a, a, a large ticket item for any community uh, to handle. So it was really important. The board was, our school board was very clear that we were to make sure that people understood, got all the information they need, so that they, when they went to the polls in, on March 8th, that they would have good information to make a decision. We anticipate that um, we would bond that project for 20 years, and we also um, anticipate that should we be successful in, in, in March, and I'm, gonna, I'm an optimistic uh, person by nature, so when we pass it in March, um, we would begin the project in uh, the summer of 2016. They would not wait. They will be ready to go. 
some of the issues that will be addressed in this building will be around mechanical systems, and that's like HVAC. That's our heating, ventilation, um, our air quality is very poor in that building. Quite frankly, there is no ventilation system in that building to speak of. We ventilate that building, we open the window. It just doesn't uh, lend itself to a good system for air quality in the building, so we know that we have to address that. We have major plumbing issues. Bathrooms all need to be redone. They need to come up to ADA standards, um, and, and as you know, that's the uh, Disabilities Act, which, um, which we are required to adhere to, um, as well as safety and uh, issues. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the traffic out on Academy Ave, uh, this, this project will address that concern. We're also concerned about safety building. As you know, our school buildings have become very vulnerable. Uh, have become very vulnerable. Oh, thanks, Nathan. I didn't want that to go down. <laughs> yeah, have been very vulnerable over the years. Uh, so we have a lot of new safety uh, compliance issues that we must put in place uh, to ensure that our children are safe. And so those, those kinds of issues will be also addressed uh, with this project. Electrical work is it needs a tremendous amount of, uh, of electrical work given the demands of technology. Our students, we have a one-to-one -one, uh, computer uh, relationship. Uh, 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 we have Chromebooks to students so that the kids are on uh, some type of a device all day, um, using it in all of their classes. And so it has become very much a part of their education. But with that comes upgrades that you need relative to things like your electrical power. I mean, some of the classrooms have one plug. 1939, they only needed one plug. But in 19, in 2016, uh, we, we need a little bit more than that. So those kinds of things would be addressed. We're also going to, we also have some uh, issues around um, uh, entrances and egresses, uh, doors, windows. Um, all of those haven't been replaced in many, many years, um, and, th and they need to be replaced. We need to separate and identify egresses and entrances for kids uh, and separate them from adults, and that's really important, so those, those kinds of things need to be done. In addition, probably the most important thing to me as, 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 as your superintendent is that um, we need to have high-quality programs, and we need to continue to strive you know, you should be very pleased. The children in Hampton do very well. Uh, their academic performance year in and year out has been um, very, very good. Uh, their, their, um, their results on their state assessments have always been above state average and, as you know, have, been, uh, have received a number of kudos statewide relative to the performance of their schools. So you should be pleased with that. But as we continue to push and move forward and prepare our kids for Winnicott and High School and then um, perhaps college, uh, our career, or the military, we, we have a lot of things that we need to do. And we can't wait until they're in high school. We are looking to address science labs. We have six science labs. Four of them are undersized and have, do not have the kinds of equipment and space and lab work that we would require of middle schools. We also are now have a STEM lab, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And all of our kids are exposed to that now, but we don't really have the facility to do that. We've sort of had a makeshift um, classroom to be able to service the kids with STEM. Um, we also have, right now, we, we have a band room that's downstairs in the basement in the old wood shop. There's no facility for band, so that we would address that in the building along with chorus. Uh, in addition to that, um, we have an undersized art room that doesn't have a lot of the sort of the, the, the supports that an art room would have, a kiln and some of the big tables and drying areas so that kids can do their artwork. Um, we are very involved, as you know, in, in cable and Channel 13. Um, our students at the middle school are producing a weekly uh, news show. Um, they go live on Monday, and on Fridays they do a recorded show. Uh, so they're, they're, they're using all the technology. They're filming. Uh, they're, they're doing all the listening, speaking, viewing, um, interviewing. Uh, they have, so that will be part of the technology that will be incorporated into this building. Um, trying to highlight the areas. There are also a lot of common areas in the building that need some attention. We, we have a cafeteria and a kitchen. The kitchen is undersized. 
quite frankly, we've been dinged by the state. They come down and they um, uh, they do a, a review of our program, uh, and we've been asked to make some changes in our kitchen because it's so small. We're doing things next to the dishwasher that we shouldn't be doing next to the dishwasher, and so we're, we'll we'll improve the kitchen area by making that larger and improving the cafeteria for the children. Uh, we also need to improve some areas for privacy. Um, if a youngster has to go to the school nurse, they have to sit out in the hallway to wait because there might be somebody else in the nurse's room, and, and that's not a good idea. Or if a student is waiting to see the principal, um, there's not a place for them to sit that's private and confidential. They sometimes are sitting out in the hallway, so people come in and they speculate why this student would be sitting out in the hallway. So we can all make a judgment, can't we? But um, they really could be there to get their award. You know, you just don't know. But I like to think they're in there to get their awards. But it's that kind of thing that we have to think about, even with the guidance counselors. They have an office right in the main hallway, but they have no waiting area. If you're going to go to see the guidance counselor, you might be sitting outside in the hallway in a chair waiting to see, and that's not, that's really not acceptable. So some of those common areas that all kids would access, we would like to improve on. Um, we uh, do not have a gymnasium currently at Hampton Academy that we can use. Uh, we uh, are currently renting space at the rim because our kids don't have a regulation size basketball court that they can play and other teams come and play with our, our youngsters at Hampton, both boys and girls, um, plus some of their after school um, pickup games. Um, so we, um, we are proposing in, 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 this, uh, in this proposal, we are uh, proposing a gymnasium, a full size gymnasium. Uh, we're also proposing a, uh, an auditorium. We have no facility at Hampton Academy, or quite frankly, in the community other than Winnicunnan, that we have an auditorium that we can do um, activities, plays, lectures, um, music programs, band programs, all the things that are happen in a school. So that that is also part of our proposal. And those are common areas. You know, we've been meeting uh, for about a year and a half now. We have a facility committee that represents all, all of our stakeholders. We have community members, we have government officials, we have teachers, parents um, serving on this committee. And one of the things that they made very, very clear about this building, and they said it from the beginning, that this was about community. That this school was not going to be a school that was open from 7 to 3 and then closed down. But they wanted this school to be accessible to the community so that when the recreation department needed to use a gymnasium to have their games and their HYA has their uh, activities for the children, that they be able to use that facility. That it, Actually, the recreation director is on the committee. Um, so we also have the same with the um, auditorium. I was talking to um, our town manager, um, Mr. Welsh, and he has expressed an interest in holding his meetings and his activities that he does because he doesn't have a facility um, that, that he can use uh, without having to pay for. So this would, uh, uh, this would provide the community with, a, again, another place uh, for us to do events as a community. The other feature that, the, that was very clear from the facilities committee, and by the way, we did a lot of surveys and we had interviews. We interviewed people and asked them what they wanted, what they thought we should have. One of the other features that they mentioned was a room for seniors. I think this has been an issue in the community relative to providing space for seniors to have activities. They currently are all over the place, I understand. Um, but they are they use the basement room in the in the uh, library, and I've been down there when they've been down there. It's it's not the best of accommodations. So in this proposal, uh, we have by the gymnasium, which is the public, we have put in a community room for seniors, about a 1,400 square foot room with accommodations so that they could have uh, uh, coffee and tea and whatever they wanted to eat. They could have their lunch there if they wanted. They could do their activities there. They could store their 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 crafts because I know they do some of that and they know they play bingo. So. The committee uh, really pushed hard to see that our seniors had a community room. Now, they're not going to use it every day, uh, seven days a week, and use maybe not even at night. But there are other organizations in town that could use this as a, as a place uh, to hold their events. 
And because we're now Channel 13 and have cable, we're going to be able to televise some of the activities. So let's say, for instance, you have a big agenda and you have 50 people attending your meeting and you can't fit in this room. That would be a place that you could use and it still be televised. So um, the, the committee was pretty adamant about um, providing for uh, the community and, and, and meeting their needs. Talk about the yeah. plan a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. So talk about money in a second, but before we get to that, let me show you the, the fun stuff. Go back to this guy. So the notion, here's the notion essentially, and we can talk about the phasing of it, the how we're going to get it done. <coughs> here's Academy Avenue. Here's High Street. Cemetery's here. When it comes running down here with the fire station, just off the bottom of this, this picture here. This is the old 1930s facility, right? The original building, and this is the wing that was constructed in the 60s. Out underneath this area is where the, we call it the sixth grade wing, which was 70s construction. Uh, that speaks for itself, sadly. And so the, the proposal right now is that if we're approved, we'll move forward quickly, and this summer we'll work to demolish the space that's, or the, the property or the uh, structure that's here, and then along this whole back side, over the course of the 16-17 school year, we will construct a replacement, which will have a gymnasium on this end, and we'll have classroom spaces across the back here. And then in the subsequent summer, this is the summer of 17, they'll be working in the cafeteria and the kitchen, because they have to turn that over. They've just got the summer to do it, and we need it again when kids come back. And then in that second school year, 17-18, They'll start renovations in the 60s wing and then turn it over back to the kids and they'll move over into the original 30s facility and they'll do the renovations in that space. On page five of your handout, there's a colorful document that you can refer to for that same page. The red, the red they were tasked to do in the first summer, well, excuse me, the first school year, and then they move on to the orange in the, first, in the second summer, the green in the first half of 17-18, and the blue in the second half. And the project will be done as we wrapped up the summer of 18. So it's about a two-year cycle from, from breaking ground, if you will, breaking ground by breaking things up uh, in the summer of 16 and be done before school starts in 18. But very quickly, these are available on the, these are available on the, on the web. You can take a peek at the, at the facility's website. Upstairs, from the second floor, you're looking at the roof of the gym. You can see the classroom wings. You can see art classroom being constructed. You can see the auditorium being built in the Eastman Gym. The old, traditional, the beautiful Eastman Gym would become turned around, aimed at a new stage off the back end. The seating would actually be inside the existing Eastman Gym. If I find the first floor, you go down a floor. You now you see into the gymnasium. Uh, on the second level, you see additional classrooms and the auditorium again. Out back, you see band and music here off the end of the stage. And then some of you went to school here and you had wood shop in the old shop. That's been the band room until recently. That goes into, it becomes maintenance and storage rather than having students in the basement any longer. And the cafeteria would get its pick me up along with the kitchen, and there's the gym that we kind of spoke about. So the phasing was something I wanted to make sure that I talked about because a couple of times the question has been asked, how, do you, how are you going to get it done? We've got a great team that's working with us, including the H.L. Turner Group. They're the architects and engineering firm out of Concord. Uh, we're working with Bonnet, Page, and Stone. They're the construction uh, management firm. They're out of Laconia. Everything these folks are doing is renovation now. And in very many, many, most, in fact, of the cases that or the, the projects that they do in the in the schools of New Hampshire, especially in the absence of state building aid, they're working on schools while they're using while we're using schools. So these are some great firms that have some great experience doing the kind of work that we'd be talking about doing. So that's the that's the phasing of it. Should we you talk, talk about, about the money? The money. Yeah. If you go to page six of that same document, you'll see the the financial. Please. Before you get to the money, yeah. is the footprint different on the what what is additional from the original yep. footprint? So if I go back to this oops, oh, Right there. I go back to this guy. Yeah. All right. All right. So that's that, that light colored tan. That's all original. We'll we'll expand off the back of the Eastman Gym here with the with the art upstairs, band and music downstairs, and a stage. 
and then the sixth grade wing goes away and uh, on top of that spot we put in the new gym and some additional classrooms so this is all new back here and that just gets renovated one of the things that was clear too from the committee was is that we were to preserve the historic nature of that building and I think there isn't anybody who would disagree that when you drive by that building it, it is the it, aesthetically it is it is beautiful and that will be preserved and as much of the internal some of the woodwork they're looking at how we can move work that into any areas so um, although we have to do some renovation, uh, we the, the the deal was we've got to preserve what was there. Go ahead, Dayton. Yeah. Thank you. So the I mean, really renovation. The superintendent mentioned it at the outset. There's some real systems work that has to be done. Mechanicals, electrical. I mean, a lot of upgrades. Air is maybe the most significant of those. And she mentioned that there just isn't anything and in any commercial space that you're in today. There are CO2 sensors. We're talking about. We're talking about the turnover of air. Even if we're not talking about the heating or the or the cooling or the humidifi dehumidifying of air, we're talking about rotating it and moving it so there's always fresh air in the space. That doesn't exist anywhere in Hampton Academy right now. That's a real important element of the project. Don't let me talk too fast about money, but you know, we're trying to make it trying to make it as simple as we can, right? So three pieces that add up to twenty four point nine million. Three pieces. First is hard cost, the real construction, which is demolition, it's the construction cost, it's the renovation of existing spaces, it's all the site work, although there's not a lot of site work, because we're not talking about work in the fields or anything like that, we just have to work in the property. We didn't talk, but let me mention briefly parking and bus loop. One of the things that's been important is moving the, moving the parents and all of the parent pickup and drop off off Hampton Academy, right? So part of the site work is that there'll be a loop for the buses, there'll be a loop for the parents, they'll be separated. This will also allow itself to uh, for us to provide some greater security to the building because the bus loop is likely not to be open during the day, that much greater distance between you and a vehicle and the school building itself. Um, and then and then the parking will essentially remain where it is. We do pick up a few extra spaces and there's a handicapped uh, parking opportunity being created out front of the building. So construction, hard cost, $21,895,000 is wrapped up in all of that. And that's the the estimate that's been done right now, our project management team, our, our owner's project manager, something that we thought was going to be really important, Trident Advantage um, Group out of Salem, working as our conscience, bringing expertise. The superintendent and I have got some, some great experience, but these guys do this. They do this every day, and so they're working with us, and they've worked with the architects and the construction management crew to bring forward this estimated uh, construction cost, 21895 Added to that are soft costs. Soft costs pick up first the fees related to architectural engineering. Already we've done a good job. Normally it's about <coughs> seven and a half to nine percent of your construction cost. That's the range that the architects and engineers charge you. We're at four and a half percent. So we've saved somewhere around eight hundred plus thousand dollars in that effort. Our, our owner's project management firm, uh, their services throughout the project will be uh, part of that soft cost. FF&E, your furniture, fixtures, and equipment. We're going to have very little of that. Superintendent has already worked with staff to, to complete an inventory of what's there. We expect to keep 75% of the furniture, fixtures, and equipment rolling forward. We put that in an inventory terms so that over time we still see desks and chairs replaced, but we don't need a complete house full of brand new stuff. And we don't need to mortgage that as a part of this bonding. So 75% of that stuff will remain. Technology is built into that. And there's really that's about bringing fiber into the school and making sure the bandwidth is there to support all that's happening in our classrooms right now. Uh, and commissioning is going to be a real important element. Commissioning is that third party testing element that we'll do to protect the taxpayers' investment. So when we when we pour concrete, it'll be tested third party to make sure that it meets spec. When there's rebar in there, the steel will be tested, etc. Throughout the process, there'll be commissioning that'll go on. That's one point nine five million dollars, and really in there we've seen some great savings already. And then you know that the issue that always seems to drive the most concern or question is the is the allowance or the contingency and in this case they've proposed for us a, an owner's contingency of 1.1 million dollars that again is a, a percentage far smaller than what industries industry averages seem to be when they do projects like this in our case we're, we're less concerned with what we might dig up in the ground if you think about the ground that we're going to be digging in we've already dug in it once before that's all ground that we've claimed and we've paved, we've claimed and we've built on. So there shouldn't be a whole lot that we'll find underground. It's going to be a big concern. 
but in that existing structure, I know Keith Lassard and his crew have done a great job, and he, he has in the dozen plus 14, 15 years he's been there, he's abated every bit of asbestos that he's ever found. We will find things that need to be abated that we haven't identified yet, and we may yet find some things in the existing structure. So that 1.1 million provides for that contingency, and that number will get tighter and tighter as we get closer and deeper into the project. So $24,945,000 is the proposed cost that will be Article 1 on the school ballot. What's that mean to you specifically? Go to the next slide if you can see it, or go into the blue sheets that we've added, uh, we've handed out the tax impact is proposed there. What will be on the ballot is not just the $24,945,000, but another $460,550. That's when we sell the bonds, that's the first year's interest payment that has to be paid. We don't actually make a principal payment until the next year. So on the ballot, you'd be asked to approve that 460000 That's new cost, new money. That'll cost you $0.17 cents per thousand. And on, I talked to Ed Tinker, the assessor. He told me the average single-family home value as appraised or as assessed for tax purposes is three hundred and thirty grand right now, 330000 So on that average $330,000 house, that's an extra $56. That's a new $56 of tax impact that you'd be approving on the ballot. A year later, the budget has to go up to reflect the full impact of the of the payment. We already have the 460. We also have the bond that we're paying right now on the Marston edition we did back in '96. That matures and comes good, so that money's already in the budget. Another 340 grand. We'll add that, and we need to raise the budget another 875 thousand. That'll cost you a new 32 cents a thousand. So back to your 330 thousand dollar house. That means that. This coming Christmas, I shouldn't say Christmas because it's not like Christmas, but that's what it is, right? We get the tax bill there for Christmas. This coming December, you'll see a bill that'll go up on the average home 56 bucks. A year later, you'll see the average home get a bill go up by about $106. It's a total of $162 of new money that you'd be paying out the rest of the 20 year. If your home is closer to a half a million dollars, for what it's worth, I provided that too, it's in the first year $84 and a half, $84.50. And in the second year, $177. It's $260 a year moving forward for the rest of a 20-year bond. So we said, why now? You know, why, why pick now? Why do this now? And we realized that this was the perfect time to do it. First of all, the bond rates right now are at 3.14. We've checked with the bond bank. We know that that, that price will stay steady until at least June. And so the, if we are able to go out and, 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 and buy the bond, uh, this is the perfect time. I mean, I, I kind of chuckle. My first house, my mortgage was eight and three quarters percent. This is three and one four, one, three point one four. We haven't seen this low interest rates in a very long time. And, and unfortunately, I think we're not going to continue to see them because, as you know, they've, the, the, the feds have talked about and have raised interest rates. Hasn't affected bond, long-term bond rates yet. But um, we anticipate down the road it will. So this is a perfect time relative to that. Hey, if, if it doesn't say that or if we haven't said it every time, did you say that? Every time when the Fed bumps at a quarter of a percent, right now all of the financial analysts are telling the bond bank and telling us that the long-term rates, the 20-year rates, already included the expectation that the Fed would bump the rate. But that's not true for every bump that you might see over the next year or two. Every quarter of a percent costs us total another 800 grand in interest costs. So there's some value in you know, there's some value in not waiting when you think about the Fed maybe bumping that rate a quarter of a percent multiple times and, and your cost escalating by eight hundred thousand every time they do. So So and Nathan mentioned that both uh, Marston will Marston bond will be paid off in August of two thousand and sixteen and the twenty year bond that is cu we currently have on center school will be paid off in August of two thousand and eighteen. So that's another reason why we would we thought that this was a good time. Um, in addition, uh, we looked at the town, uh, the C CIP, and see what they had for projects. Uh, and we th we saw that there wasn't any major project. Not that there isn't projects in the community, because we know there are. I mean, I won't, no, let's not kid ourselves. But major project of a building or, or a substantial um, water sewer pro uh, issue um, wasn't there. So we felt that this was also a good time. And, and, and as, as it shows in your packet, um, you know, I, I just happened to clip some things out of the local paper. Um, we, we know that you can see them on page, uh, I don't know, the I guess it's the last page, uh, page 8. Um, wages in New Hampshire expected to increase. Uh, this, 
the state uh, is, is gaining residents, so we know that we our population is going up. Um, New Hampshire businesses say 2016 has bright promise. So with all of those indicators, the board voted uh, to move forward and support this uh, proposal uh, to, uh, to renovate and provide some reconstruction to Hampton Academy. So um, do you have any plans on having, uh, um, what we found here, we, we went three years, it's a beautiful building now, it had changed over the past. Um But what convinced a lot of people was they, we, and I had talked to the chief at the time, I said, let's set up a tour and bring some people through this building. Because mm -hmm. the building was so bad, it was disgraceful, the old fire station on the beach. So it might be something you want to bring people through. And, um, We've I mean, been doing that. We've had. Um, I understand that the, you know the kids that are in the school system. Their parents have been through. They've seen things in the, in the school. Um, but um, there's a lot of people that yes, haven't been are. in that school for years. That's and right. It might be something right. you want to get. Some That's right. Uh, we we uh, will continue to do that right up through March. Dave O'Connor, our building principal, is there and has uh, does individual tours. Um, we probably will stage a few on a Saturday because that's the best time for families, you know, when people aren't at work and running and racing home. So, uh, that, you know, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's, it's a great way for them to get to see that building. I think they will be surprised. So what we, we're, we're a little more open as a meeting, so we have people here, so uh, if you want to get yeah, we're, questions we're, on. Yeah, oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. We, Glenn? Uh, how many students do you currently serve? What do you anticipate the growth to be? Well, it's interesting. You know, the growth really flattened out at Hampton Academy. It was at 420 um, within the last couple of years, but we've dropped down to 480. Um, but next year, we've had a, a, a significant increase. You know, when I talked about the census changing, we've had a significant uh, resurgence of student enrollment. So we anticipate that next year there'll be around 410 and it'll stay around that for the next five years, between 410 and 450. Um, what, how, what grades are there? Grades grade six, six, seven, and eight. Six, seven, eight. All middle school. Um, no. We have reached out to a neighboring community to see if there was any interest in joining with us and collaborating with us. Um, and they have a very small population of sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. So our board chair has reached out to Hampton Falls to see if there was any interest in, in their, their middle schoolers coming because they've had some issues around their building proposals. So uh, those discussions are continuing. We're just really in the infancy stage of that. But um, we feel that we could accommodate some students, which would be a, 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 an opportunity for them to have a place for kids and uh, with, a, with an excellent program. Um, but also, um, but also, um, that would be a revenue for us because they would pay tuition. No, you, yeah, no, I, I just I didn't want to interrupt that. Um, in the, my kids are in town and not, they don't go to um, the school. But um, talking to the neighbors and they, are they gonna, are some of the kids going to be in other schools while the construction is going on? Is that, that right? When that Nathan talked about the phasing, that sixth grade wing would be demolished, and so the current fifth graders, we um, we have to um, come up with a, pr a plan for them, and we have three or four different su suggestions about how we might accommodate them for ten months. That's all we need. We would need from June. The, through the summer, so technically their sixth grade year from September to June, which is 10 months, we would house them elsewhere. I'm meeting with the fifth grade parents next week uh, to continue those discussions, but we, we have a number of suggestions on the table uh, from, um, from renting portables uh, classrooms to uh, accommodating them currently at Marston School uh, and, um, and our renting space and the SAU moving out and giving up the rooms that we have in those buildings in, 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 in our office renting space. So we have a, a lot of options for the kids. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that was so important to the kids and to the families was that they would get the same program at Hampton Academy. And we have promised the, the students that their program, wherever they are, <coughs> would be identical to what would have been offered had they been housed in that building. Really, the biggest thing for the kids is that the snack time <laughs> offerings are different at the academy. And we promise that we'll make sure they get access to so all the we, goodies. So we 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 found out they we found today. out they have ice cream, and the other kids don't at the elementary school. So they made sure they were going to get their ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 
but hey, um, it, it the, you know what's we'll meet with the students too. We have a meeting scheduled with the fifth graders, and so we'll talk with them. We'll talk with their parents, and uh, we do have three or four different um, solutions, and we'll find the one that's that best meets the kids' needs. The beauty of Hampton is it's a village, you know, when we looked at all the um, planning way back, you know, they did the charrettes and all, always talking about the village, always wanting to have activity down in that area. So that's one of the reasons why the board didn't vote to build new over on um, Toll Farm Road. Road, the piece of property that they own, because they felt that they wanted to continue to have Hampton Academy as the center and the two elementary schools on both ends, Marston and Center. There appears to be a lot of land out there, and from the board there, you can see there's a lot of land. Um, renovations are very costly. You pay them. Carefully take it down, and then you're trying to put on to whatever was there, and it's usually a headache and a half. A lot of us have done renovations. It's always Pandora's box. The question would be, why don't you just move over to the new, that all that grass area that you've got, there's a lot of there. Um, build a school, you're not gonna interrupt the kids. Get it all fitted out, remove over there, rip down the rest and just make that, you know, where the kids can play ball or, you know, have their courts and stuff like that. And, and have they taken a look at that? The, the reason that there now, was discussion about I that. I hope it's not because they can't go outside and play basketball. No, it, it had to do with um, preserving um, the history of that building. The history the, of the The brick building, the all of the, the outside, uh, the, the cupola, the everything. They did not want, they wanted that history of that building preserved. And so that's one of the reasons why they didn't build new. That it, grassy area you're referring to is their field, which, which yeah. you know, I hear you. Um, but uh, that but was really... Ten months. Uh, yeah, but and I is, understand is that, but... the building going to be brick? All schools are brick. Right. It, it was preserving that building and the way it looked to the community. But there's, so. a, there's a financial element to it as well, because... That, that's folks, the part folks, I was trying to Right, folks always understand say, that. and I understand... In the purest sense, people will say, well, new construction is cheaper than renovation, except mm -hmm. the renovation, especially, and that's what New Hampshire schools are all feeling, mm -hmm. renovation limits your scope. They'll, they're estimating in the $240, $250, dollars $250 range for new construction, but their renovation will be somewhere in the vicinity of $135 to $150 a square foot. So you on renovation? On renovation. Versus no? Well, you're going to keep the bones. You're going to keep the, the walls. You're not going to move supporting walls. You're not going to use you know, structural walls. We're, we're going to renovate so that we can bring in duct work and air handling and upgrade systems, but we're not going to rip down a structure. And so you limit your, you limit your scope because you work with what you have. So on a significant chunk of square footage, we're at 150, let's say, a dollar a square foot, where in the new construction, we're at 240. One thing that amazes us, when Nathan and I came five years ago, they had a price for new construction, for a new middle school, when we came in 2008, for $28 million. That was the price tag on the table. And the, and the renovation was going to cost 26. So when we, when we did this work over the last year and a half, and, and, the, and the number came in at $24 million for the renovation, we knew that we had we were in a good place relative to what they quoted 45 years ago at 26 and 28 million for new construction so and renovation so what's the future of the land out on Toll Farm Road well we did look at that you know because it was a question about whether we could sell it you know and and and, and, the, and the caveats within the deeds do not allow us to do that um, and so the, the, the land must stay in the hands of the the school district for the purpose of, of students. Now, I there's been some discussion about that land becoming, you know, ball fields and play fields for kids because we are very limited in town. We have Tuck Field, you know, really, uh, Winnicott and High School, but, you know, the high school kids are on those fields all the time. It's tough to really, um, although I'm sure on weekends they're using it, but um, they, there's been some discussion. I've actually seen some proposals for field space out on Tuck. Uh, out on Toll Farm Road, right. but we can't. We can't sell it. We can't put a sign up. We don't want to sell. It. We don't want to sell anything. Yeah. All right. I, um, anybody else? I 
think uh, thank you, you have very a great proposal much. and good luck with it. Thank you, thank uh, you. And please, if anybody wants a tour or has any questions, <laughs> call us. Yeah, that's right. All right. Thank you very much. The caveats that are on that land, Kathleen, the land on Coal Farm Road, um, was that put on there by the original sellers? Don't. Yes. The, the deed and yeah, how it was so. to be used, yeah. Oh, it was very clear. And the land passed hands several times. It's actually, uh, at one point, the Kiwanis Club. Right, it came from the Kiwanis Club, from uh, the families that owned that. So it went from the families to the Kiwanis Club, uh, then to the school district. Yeah. You're right. And the Kiwanis Club no longer exists. At the right, and we researched it. You know, we, we dug out all the deeds examine them so that we knew what would happen. We actually have a land transfer too, you know. Um, the town owned the Arnold Martell property that is right next to the, the Hampton Academy. And so you'll see in the warrants that we're asking for a land transfer for the town to, to transfer that land to the school district and for us to accept it. Um, that will allow us um, more access with the buses and get those parents and buses off the main road um, and also for parking. So we hope that will be part of the people. Good, great questions. Thanks. Yours is the best question that needs to be added to the FAQ, so we have a good solid answer because it won't be the. It's not the first time it's been asked, but send me a quick email if you want, and I'll make sure that when when I when the guys who can answer this better get together and do this, we'll get it done. Okay. Thank you. 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 We're going to scoop. We have another yes, meeting. Yes, absolutely. All right, no problem. Good <laughs> luck. No problem. Yep. <laughs> Interesting that Kiwanis Club, most of the old guys have transferred this land are no longer alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, so oh, okay. <laughs> I was I was a past president of the Kiwanis Club back when it when it finally dissolved. I bought three of myself and maybe. Thank you very much for the presentation. That All right, Kristen from RS Fireworks. Uh, before we even start, I want to comment. I've got more compliments on the New Year's shoot. I've gotten tons of calls and how bright and amazing the shoot was. So awesome. I love to hear that. Yes, Steve shared some <coughs> with me uh, when, I, when I came in today. Um, as you know, the terrain on Hampton Beach on New Year's is hard it's a hard terrain it's got the sand and the snow and you know what we we work on it all year long figuring out how we can make it easier for the new year so i'm really happy to hear that so they've been working really hard to make that a really good show <laughs> so i am hi i am Kristen. i am with rs fireworks uh we've been doing the fireworks displays on hampton beach now for four years uh they are part of our family. We've worked with them closely um, with the fire department, with the police department, with the fire prevention, and of course, Chuck, we're on we're, um, really good communication level, So, um, and everybody, Steve, too. And uh, we really like it here. That is That brings me to, I've dropped off two um, proposals that we are bringing to the table for the next three years with Hampton Beach, doing the fireworks there. Um, in the proposals, what you're going to find, and I'll keep this brief because I know that um, you guys have other other things going on. So in the proposals, um, what you're going to find first is on that top page that you can see, the top picture. That is from, yep, yeah, right on the front. That is from Hampton Beach, actually. That is um, from 2012. We did a photo contest with a bunch of the spectators on our first year here. And he actually won a T-shirt and uh, a hat and a couple other things. So I thought I'd point that out. Uh, we haven't seen that in a couple of years, so I figured I'd put it on there. Um, we are very excited to bid for the next three years for Hampton Beach. Uh, in front of you in the proposal, it's for 2016, 2017, and 2018. After I briefly explain what you'll find in the proposal, uh, I want to answer any questions anybody has. And um, if you open the binder, first you're going to find <clears throat> a map right on the inside. The reason why I gave you all a copy of this map is from this end, you don't actually see a lot of what we do um, on our end. It's not just um, the hard workers that are out there on the beach, but it's a lot of um, communicating 
like this map with all collaterals, fire department, police department, and again, fire prevention. Uh, this is just an example. That map is what we need to pass in also to the state, letting them know how we keep spectators away uh, when we're clearing the beach before a fireworks display. That gives us a radius of our largest shell and the prediction of if something went up and didn't go off, where it would land. So you can get a really good idea of that. I figured I'd let you guys have a picture of that, I have let you keep it. <clears throat> um, On the first page, as you're going to find, I put in a copy of the cleanup and cancellation policies, which uh, Hampton is useful, but I'd like to just make sure you guys have a copy of that written down if you have any questions about that. All of this is also given to the fire department. We have composed this and put this together um, well, specifically for the fire department because they were very, very particular in what they wanted, how they wanted it. Uh, they're still like that. We're working very close with Mr. Ayotte, who is fantastic. Uh, so far, we've worked with him, and um, he is he is really good at what he does. And we're, he likes it the way we've been doing it because it's not broken. Don't fix it. Um, if anything, we, you know, change little things here and there, but he likes that. So... In this proposal, you're going to see, I did put uh, copies of the things that we have to pass on to the state and have to pass on to the fire department, just so you kind of know what we're doing, you know, what, what exactly um, we're sticking to. We have a set of rules for ourselves and guidelines and safety precautions that we stick to, and we work very closely with, the, with all collaterals here in Hampton. Uh, the table of contents is going to tell you what's in this bid and I know we're going to get to the um, exactly what we're proposing as far as budget price and as far as uh, shell count so we have a letter in there if you have some time please read it it was um, written by myself and I personalized that letter for everybody here that I've been working with um, everything included in the display is going to be on page four and those who do not have a proposal um, I can, I'm going to go through a couple of things here and there just so everybody knows. We are offering, we are submitting this bid for the consideration, and we have chosen to give a bid price for the 16, now 17 shows. Am I right? Set more up to 17 shows. Uh, for $3,250 per show, which is a $250 difference from last year and for the last four years at $3,500. With a July 4th show at 48.50, which is also a $250 discount, and we'll get to the shell count, but we're also raising that a little bit. Uh, for all contracted years, every show is going to be everything here listed will be included. Um, all insurance, workers' compensation, um, all. Our liability insurance is uh, five million, six million, which means five million per occurrence, six million aggregate. Of course, a certificate will be generated right after the um, if uh, with the bid award. Three-year contract discount, which uh, you have taken advantage of in the past, and it helps us in ways of ordering product ahead of time and saving on that cost with the rise of shells each year, and shells being the fireworks. All licensing and all applicable city and state permits, meaning we communicate directly with the state fire marshal who knows us very well and uh, who knows our lead shooter for all of 2016. We're not going to go as far as 17, 18 yet or who we're going to um, generate as our main lead shooter, but this year it will be Edward Hodgson who has been working on Hampton Beach for four years and has done majority of the shows here. So he, is, he will be our uh, go-to. <clears throat> Um, all of our shooters that are working on Hampton Beach, we always have at least five. Anybody extra that is on the shoot site with them obviously has, an, uh, has been cleared with, our AT, um, with the ATF through our license. And we use Hampton Beach as a training also. So they have not necessarily, you know, here's your first time, but they need to get used to the terrain, Hampton Beach. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work and walking through the sand and things like that's really good to show our um, show our shooters that it isn't just nice green cut grass and flat surfaces so um, it actually works very well for us as well we'll have um, the shows will 
maintain nine to 12 minutes. I know we had a couple that went up to 15. Due to weather, due to um, um, misfiring, it, let me take that back. I don't like that word, misfire. Um, sometimes they don't do everything that we want them to do at the exact second we want them to do it. It happens, but um, I think a couple times this year, we or last year, we had uh, we pushed it up to about 15 minutes. Generally, we want to keep it between 9 and 12. Busy with the shell count that we're giving you. You're looking at an average of two to three seconds in between shells. Mid-show barrage. Uh, an opening as we always do. We are going to keep the cakes. Uh, I know that people that are weighed, now cakes are the uh, lower effect, two inch, so they don't go all the way up. Um, sometimes you can see um, some of the kids or whatever sh shooting it on the beach sometimes after the fireworks shows, especially on 4th of July. Those are cakes. Our cakes are professional grade, uh, class B cakes. They're two inch or less. Yes, you wouldn't be able to see them <coughs> from probably Salisbury Beach watching our display, however, or um, uh, if a building is in front of you. However, a lot of the spectators sit along the, stand along that beach and they love them. Uh, so we are maintaining like we always have that when we shoot those lower effects off that there's always something larger going off so there's no pauses for the people that are sitting large, uh, further away. So uh, we, will, we do want to keep those in there. <clears throat> three-stage opening our mid show our midway barrage which sometimes we throw in there halfway through sometimes we make it um, or so uh, with communication uh, right before the finale just to give it a little bit of a you know a fake finale um, look we um, the way I broke down which I will I will explain uh, we are going to again put anywhere from four to six flights in flights and scenes our RS fireworks um, we, we we love them. This is our. This is what makes us us and different from the rest. Uh, our flights and scenes shells. We hand pick them, and most of these shells are very hard to acquire. We wait. We'll wait. We'll wait until March. We find something that catches our eye. They're the longer burning effects. They're the ones that make you go, "Ooh, my goodness!" And there's 20 of them all in the sky, and they long burn, or they have that really cool crackle to them. Uh, those are our flights and scenes. A scene being most likely with a lower effect added to it. Um, but in the breakdown, which which you will see in our um, in our shell count for each part of the display, we didn't add the flights and scenes in there because we want you to know that that shell count that we would use for those flights and scenes would be added to the main display. So the main main display shell count. Um, if any of you have seen our displays here, I, I'm sure that you could probably remember a pinpoint when you've seen what I've called a flight or a scene when there's uh, a willows or uh, actually we've used it for a, one of our mid-show barrages before. It was pretty neat. A, um, and of course on July 4th we have the large, set, the large flag set piece that we will be doing again. Uh, so for 2000 so on page five, you're going to see a breakdown of the contract and, and uh, discount details for a three-year contract. Much like um, our last, we are going to do 2016, 2017, 2018, which I've already discussed the, uh, the budget at $3,250 per each show and July 4th being at $4,850. Our weekly shell count is going to be $519. Our July 4th shell count, we're bumping up also to 719. You go to the next page on page 6. This is our breakdown. This is showing you where we're going to put the cakes uh, when we do have them. On July 4th, there, there are more, so uh, we get a little more creative with that. Um, you need to know the difference between shots and shells. Yeah. We do not want to add that. The 300 shots listed under B cakes is not added to our shell count. Cakes are not shells. It <laughs> doesn't matter how pretty I can make the box. It's not, it's not, um, you wouldn't be able to see them like you could see the two and a half, the threes, and of course the fours. So we do not count them in our shell count. <clears throat> With shell is. How many, if you see one thing go up, how many shells is that? If you see one, one large yeah. up high, that is one. That's just one shell. That is one shell. People have done that. <laughs> People have tried to do that. Actually, believe it or not, the owner of RS Fireworks can do that by looking at a video. 
Wow. And he will come within 10 of anywhere. Yeah, he's pretty good at it. <laughs> Kristen, how long is an average shoot? How long are the shoots every Wednesday, pretty much? Uh, we keep Wednesday. them between 9 and 12 minutes. Okay. And the fourth would be longer. Oh, yeah, the fourth is going to be 15. It's not going to be less than 15 minutes. There's no way to do that less than 15 minutes. The the shell count that we have, you'd have to, I mean, yes, it would be pretty, but it'd probably get boring if we shove that into nine minutes. All you're just going to, you know, you just want to be a little more creative with it, not necessarily drown it out, but, um, you know, people are driving from all parts of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. We, we kind of, you know, we make it 15 minutes. It's a, I think it's a good time. Yeah, you don't want shopping. it too long, you don't want it too short. It's yeah. kind of a trend. Yeah. How long was the one at uh, New Year's Eve? That I don't know. That I'm not sure. I didn't get the information from that. 13, I want to tell you. 13 yeah. white concert. Okay, because I was going to say yeah. 15. 13 minutes? Yes. Seemed like a, just about right. Yeah. Because you, uh, you said if you go too long, yeah. people start, you know, when's this thing ending, you know? Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> but that's what we say too when people are talking in between if people are talking in between shells going off we're not doing our job right um, this is why we like to take constructive criticism one of the things that I always liked your company versus the company we had in the past some other companies is that it's there's always something going on rather than I can remember some other shoots that you know bang and then you can count to ten bang you know and so, but you've always kept the tight, you know, keep this thing going. Yes. I like that. <laughs> uh, we like to, we're all about quality when it comes comes to this. A lot of people, a lot of companies, they order um, what, they, what they would call assorted shell boxes. Now, we all do it. We're, we're not just, they're not the only companies. We do it as well. However, if you buy an assorted <coughs> case, and you buy a hundred of them, that assorted kit, you're, you're only going to see about 10 different effects over a period of your whole, the whole body of your show. We don't like to do that. I don't want to see a, a willow crossette, willow crossette throughout the whole show and just because they're different colors. I mean, has it happened? Sure. A couple times like where, you know, you, you skip couple, you know, skip a couple boxes and you, and you kind of mix them in together. You try your best. However, we don't like doing that. We like to mix them up, mix them up, find new things. They're always, always searching for new shells, especially with the flight and, flights and scenes, ordering them from different countries, which is really cool on top of it. It's just... It's just something that we like to do. Our flights and scenes make us who we are. Um, our quality of our shows makes us who we are. We like to keep the um, the customer happy. We keep we treat them as family. It's a very small it's a small business, and you know our our, our small clientele that we keep we take care of. <laughs> we try. Do you vary the shoot each week? If I came the first of August and the thirtieth of August. But I see the same shoot twice. I'm going to say, I'm going to say you got about an 85 percent chance. Will it ever? Will it be exactly the same? Absolutely not. None of them. No two shows are alike. Um, it's impossible to do that with our product and our shooters. Even it, we mix up. Um, we have a list of five shooters, which I'll show you there. Um, list of five shooters. They all have their little, uh, a little bit of a. Um, uh, yeah, their own little style to it. Um, so no, you got an eighty-five percent chance that if you come on that shoot, or maybe even a ninety percent, you come on that next display and you say, "I remember seeing that." That might happen. Will it be the same display? No way. No. So that actually leads me to the next on page. I think it's page nine. Um, we have been obviously working with Edward. I know, I think a lot of you know him. Uh, the State Fire Marshal has a great rapport with Ed. He is uh, preparing to shoot our Wednesday shows this year if we are awarded the bid. We like to do this at the beginning of the year to <coughs> try to get commitment from one of our good shooters that will, um, that will work with us throughout the year. It's um, what I've noticed best with the fire department and the police department is they like consistency. I like consistency. Sean likes consistency. Um, if it's no surprises, this is a, a, a dangerous um, terrain, if you want to call it. 
it can it can be a dangerous thing if you don't take if you don't give it a lot of respect and um, planning and a lot of attention you're you're looking for problems so we like to keep it as consistent as possible uh, Ed has been shooting the like I said he's been shooting the Hampton Beach fireworks shows for the, the entire since our very first display um, I have three references for him on page nine as well. I decided to do that a little differently this year. I wanted you to get an idea of who's actually behind these, just so you have, um, if you ever want to find out. He's got a great rapport with Chris Wyman, who was his first reference there. If you want to find out about um, confirmation of his licensure, uh, the amount of shows he has, dis um, he has shot, and uh, his communication with Chris, who actually he requests him, and he requests him a lot. So <laughs> they've got a really good rapport. Um, and a couple other ones there that they, he works very close with. On the next page, I think that's what you're looking at. I also, for the fire department, the police department, and fire prevention, when we have our meeting at the beginning of the year, I think if it was, uh, I think it was in March last year, uh, we all get together around a big round table and we just talk about everything going on. This stuff that you are seeing in this bid uh, is already put together for them at this at that point, with four copies, so everybody is on the same page. I work very hard at making sure that this is this goes off exactly how we want it and also how they want it. Um, that page there that has the license, the picture of the licenses of uh, five other shooters, those are our shooters that have worked here in the past. I think a couple of you may know, obviously, Sean and Rob, who are the owners, the CEO and the COO, who are always there and on call. Uh, then you have Mike Ravella, um, Ed, and I think I have Larry in there too, who shot all last year. and. I think he moved to Florida. <laughs> he's, he's thinking about coming back and thinking about not. So um, Ed will most likely be shooting the majority of the displays this year. Um, also, in your bid, we have on page 16 a list of all of our references. And um, Chuck, you're on there. I just thought I'd let you know that now. <laughs> Uh, we also, they're continued on to the next page. And then on page 18, we have a link to Site Jabber up at the top. Underneath is a bunch of reviews that we have received through this, through this neat little website. <coughs> this Site Jabber website that I have put on at the top of that page, page 18, uh, anybody can go to there. We are going to make sure that a lot of spectators from Hampton see that this year. Uh, we've gotten a lot of great reviews from it, and um, I, I actually added them in here just for people to read if they really want to know what we're doing outside of Hampton. And um, I, just, I think it's great. I mean, you know what? We're, we're not carrying cancer or anything, but um, we really take pride in what we do, and we really like doing what we do here. So some of these and other places. <laughs> also... At the very end, I have another um, page, the last page of this bid. It is a, um, an RS fire schedule at Hampton Beach Displays. We also make this. We revise it. We do whatever we think fits. Usually at that first meeting with all collaterals, we'll go over and we'll just make sure this works for everybody. This is a list of everything that we do from the second we step foot or we drive onto the shoot site to when we leave. Uh, we have been doing this for four years with, with the fire department and the police department. It seems to work very well. We stick to, I mean, do things come up? Yep, they do. But we have seen them come up enough times where we can, can't predict the future, but we can, we're that close to figuring it out. Like if something comes up, we, we figure it out. Um, for the most part, we stick right by this. So this page is also given to your um, uh, Chief Ayotte and Chief Sawyer. On the back of this binder, you're going to find a list of all the numbers of, for 2016 as of right now. So it's updated for RS Fireworks. 
So uh, my number is on there, Sean, Rob, your lead shooter, Ed Hodgson. So even if you do not know if Ed's not there, <laughs> even if Ed isn't shooting that particular display, he's always on call for anybody to call to find out what is going on in that display. Uh, very rarely could you ever not get in touch with me or Sean um, in the case that you have a shoot question. Ed's there. He's made his uh, work cell available for anybody to give a call. Of course, always call me first because I always have my phone on me and I can usually answer most of the questions that anybody has. <laughs> can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sir. Does your industry traditionally have many things shoots on, on um, St. Patrick's Day? Uh, I wish. So I'm Patrick. Irish. <laughs> it's not something common. No, it isn't. Oh. Uh, I wish I saw. I wish I saw more of that. Maybe we could start something like that in the future. I would love we that. We don't have first night fireworks. We have last night fireworks. Yeah. Maybe we could be the first to have St. Patrick's, St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day fireworks. All green. You know, they make some really cool, um, different shaped shells. And you don't know any that go on anywhere today. I don't. Like and I know that they've done them in the past for weddings. Um, with lots of green and obviously traditional colors, but no, yeah, I haven't seen much. I would love that. <laughs> She's always right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Kristen, how many shoots do we have this year? We have 17 displays. It was 16, 17. Uh, if, uh, I mean, if coming up. Would be 17? It'll be 17, including the Seafood Fest that does not have anything to do with... Um, so it's really 15, 15 times 32.50 and then the 4th of July. No, that's so not right. 17 no, it's not and right. 18 is the... Um, 18 is the Seafood Fest. Seafood Fest. Okay. So you're 16 plus the 4th of July okay, separate, and then, yeah. Okay. So so you know, do we, we have seafood Fest in May? The, in your thing, you don't have the Memorial Day. In your, in your proposal, oh, so that's the one missing. Yeah. Oh, so that this. would be yeah. 17. That's, I don't have that on my list sir. That's the 29th. Yeah, the 29th. Oh, on the paper you gave me did. You know what? That's right. I cut it off on that page that I put in there. Right. It was cut off by accident. That adds another one on, doesn't so it? No, I think it's still. I think when I did the count, it was um, it was 16, and then he had told me about the June 15th, which would make it 17. That was including July 4th, 18 with with the seafood fest. We have in the past. Um, it's a different. It's a whole different entity. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah. It's a it's a a bid thing as well. I mean, <laughs> one two three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, seventeen, eighteen, including the seafood fest. That's what I have. Yeah. So seventeen. Um, 16 plus July 4th, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> what is the total budget? Come on. So, what's the first date? Really? Uh, first date is May 29th. Oh, what's the second 56, date? 56,850 dollars. Wow. Okay. What is this? I, that's a lot more this money. Like a, speak I'm oh. accustomed to spending in my world. But I think it's about 19 grand. It seems to be shooting. $10,000 on the 4th of July. I knew that. How many are we talking about? 30, 40 years ago? <laughs> 19th century. <laughs> yeah. Come on, that's that's when they were making them in America. Now they make them in yeah. China. <laughs> we were having a great conversation about not too long ago before they made, passed all those laws federally about um, the distances for each size shell. And you need to have 70 feet per every inch of what, your what's shell. What's the largest shell you can shoot? Here? Four inch in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, if you have the right distances and the right OKs, um, you can ten inch. Wow. Twelve inches are, as far as I know, are off the board at this point. They're con considered a different you class. I know you, that's what you told. Actually, them. it could it be like ten a basketball, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, they're huge. So, but are you making a bid for this contract? <laughs> <laughs> Glenn would be out there with his big lighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to comment, the dates. You have the dates. This past yeah. year, yeah, I gave you the, the seafood festival had a different company do. Yeah. I want to tell you something. It was it was unbelievable the difference between your company. Okay. Yeah. Very bad. Um, the reason being, is, <coughs> from what I understand, is that this is why I don't, I don't care whose 
room I am coming into to tell people about what we're offering them, I am going to, number one, tell you the difference between a Class C display and a Class B display. They are two different worlds. Class C display is consumer. They're coming boxes, mostly, or um, you, you go to the store on That's July 4th. Like. Anything, anything that you could buy at a store is a Class C display. Because they're legal in New Hampshire, you can do that. A Class B display is hazmat-driven, boxed in a certain way. You can only buy them with an ATF license. You need to be cleared federally, uh, locally, everywhere. It's a, um, you need to know how to handle, you need to know how to shoot them. It's, it's different, and they're larger, and you can tell the difference. When you have companies that can acquire Class C product very easily, Sometimes it's deceitful, and they, you know, they kind of put them in there. This is how many shells we're going to shoot. Because technically, yeah, in those little boxes, you have little tiny shells, and they are shells, but they're not shells. They're I could buy, if I could buy it at a store down the street with nothing. We don't consider them a shell. Take it down. Why pay even thirty? I mean, <laughs> even thirty-two. Why would you pay thirty-two hundred dollars? for a person to go onto a shoot site and shoot off a bunch of things that you could have bought and had in your backyard. There's, you pay, it, <laughs> it's is just, that where you meant it the doesn't 10, make thousand. sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, the difference is that, the difference is that. They use a lot of those. <laughs> and yeah. that particular shoot, no, it looked like, and that's yeah. what I told the commission, mm -hmm. it looked mm -hmm. like fireworks that you'd buy down in Seabrook. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because they didn't go up high, they were just, yeah. Yes. Yes. There are cakes. Just to mention, yes. this is the Jake. On during the sand sculpting contest, we literally have to leave the beach. It goes right to that wall, and we have to physically. We can't stand down like we usually do. Oh, that's some, some of the debris. Right. Exactly. Seventy-five feet, and we have to get out. That's another reason why I gave them a copy of. That's why I wanted to give you a copy of the map, just to get an idea. I mean, you know what? Sometimes, some, sometimes on the beach, we get really lucky. The wind is n nowhere to be found. They go straight up, and anything will come right back down on us. However, we're, we're on a beach. You can't predict that. So sometimes the wind is going this way. It's going fast. I have actually, if you haven't noticed on the beach, where we shoot and where we actually pull onto the beach is over 600 feet away. It's well over distance of what we need. However, when we do our um, right after shoot site, it's a uh, site walk, we walk up and down to make sure that the, any shells that didn't explode landed there. And we do that with three or four people. I have gone all the way to the caution tape and have seen debris down there because the wind can just take it. If we could even extend it past the shell, I mean, it it would just, it, it wouldn't, it, nobody's going to get hurt. It's very difficult even for that kind of wind <laughs> to take a shell, an actual shell, and carry it that far. It just so, shows we're a small mind. Exactly, is. exactly. And it's just usually that little paper that flies so easily across the beach. Well, Kristen, um, would, would you be willing to do a one year, we could approve a one year now, mm -hmm. and after the summer, extend it for the, the total of the three years. You know what's funny that you mentioned that is I actually brought that up to Sean before I left tonight and I was thinking about 2019 and I was like I wonder if if that would be something that you would have been interested in but I didn't we've always been you know it's been the three year so I didn't want to push it for a four year. No, no, we're talking maybe, three years. But you're so talking a, one year. One year and a three year. And if it's a great summer, mm -hmm. September, we will vote to, to extend the two years. Okay. Would you do that? I, I, absolutely. So if that works for you, absolutely. I'd like to make that motion uh, that we would sign, we would um, go ahead with the contract with a one year. And by September, if the season is great and we all love it, we will extend it for the additional two. I had a second on that. I'll second that. Anything else? You want discussion? No, I think. Yes. Is there any questions? <laughs> that right, so has? on. All in favor? Yeah. All right. So we'll see you this summer. Yes. Good.
Perfect. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We adjusted. We, we talked to the people and stuff, and hopefully. Thank you. Oh my gosh, you missed him. Did you see him? No. No, we came in in the beginning. Yeah. We took him right up there. I had to change him in the bathroom really quick. How old is he now? A year and a half. He's such a ham. Such a ham. Very cute. Just like his dad. He likes fireworks. There you go. Just wants to watch fireworks and play hockey. Excellent. Okay. So, Allison. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Moving right along. Allison, how do you say your last name so I don't say it wrong? Everhart. Everhart. Allison Everhart is a coastal ecosystem specialist. Okay. And she's going to give us some information about seagrass? Sand dunes. Sand dunes. Sand dunes. Sorry. Your permission, I'm going to attempt to. To go right ahead, please. Yeah. If it takes me too much time, no, I'll no, bag okay. it. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, while you're doing that, yeah. um, <laughs> we want to do some old business first. Is there anything we want to talk about? Want to talk about some old business morning while I don't she's think doing so. that? I don't think I do. No, I don't know either. No. Um, I want to oh. mention. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, meeting. While Jay's here, maybe under old business, you could give us an update. You know where we are at with the community rating system. Um, I'm not directly involved with that. Um, Rayanne, Diana, conservation coordinator, and Jason Bashan, the town planner, are involved in it. And I know they're working with Julie Branch from the Rocky Camp Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, for the info. Some more old business. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the Blue Ocean Society and all the work you did, Kathy, and for, for the New Year's and your volunteers, and also to Bill and Soraya from BC. They did a phenomenal job with the um, with the hot chocolate and the coffee and the did you have cookies. Enough? Did you have enough? They had extra cookies, and Soraya made them all. They you didn't were homemade. Have to they were not. Everything. They were wonderful. Did you have the same amount, like a big bunch of people, like you did last year? And 1,200 yeah. cookies were made. 1,200 cookies. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> they weren't store-bought. They were made. Oh, wow. that's, that's nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And she started in September. the Sea Grand and Cooperative Extension programs. And so I am leading a um, community-based sand dune restoration project here in Hampton as well as in Seabrook. Um, I have some wonderful pictures to show you that unfortunately do not seem to be cooperating. Uh, let me 
to just try one more thing, if you don't mind. Okay. I'm using a borrowed projector and computer, so I'm not entirely familiar with computers. John Cade's a technical advisor. Yes. He'll help you. John will know how to fix it. He does it all. Um, so I'll just start talking if we get the pictures great if not then uh, hopefully I can paint an image for you of what we're doing so it's a community-based sand dune restoration project we're funded by the New Hampshire coastal program so that's a program within our state Department of Environmental Services the project began last spring um, and it goes through June of 2016 so we're about two-thirds of the way through the project and our goal is really to increase coastal resilience. So when the request for proposals was put out by the Department of Environmental Services, they were looking for projects that increase our resilience. And by that, um, we want to create a New Hampshire coastline that is able to withstand or bounce back from storms, essentially. So um, I think in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, even though New Hampshire wasn't as hit as hard as some of the states to the south of us, um, we certainly did see some impacts and we see a lot of storms coming through and we want to make sure that our coastline is able to withstand them. So uh, this project, again, we're looking to restore sand dunes. We're working in two sites. Um, in Hampton, we're working at Hampton Beach State Park. In Seabrook, we're working at Harborside Park, so just on either side of um, the inlet to the estuary and uh, what we're doing is we're working with community members so we're, we're reaching out to groups such as um, such as you all here tonight we're telling you about the project and I have two requests for you today and that will be um, I'll get to that in a little bit but mostly just to spread the word help spread the word about our project help us recruit volunteers um, and also, there's one piece of the project in terms of working with coastal property owners that I'll share with you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to that little nugget to the end to keep you enticed. So, um, again, we're, we're doing a lot of planting projects. We hold, uh, we hold trainings on site. Again, this is at Hampton Beach State Park and at Harborside Park. We're teaching volunteers how to plant primarily grasses, but also some other species that are all native to New Hampshire. Um, <coughs> we're going over the planting methods, and then we're engaging volunteers in the planting projects themselves. Uh, we're working a lot with school groups. We look, we uh, <coughs> engaging Winnicott High School in coming, this coming spring. Um, we've had some students from Hampton Falls out. We've had Seabrook Middle School students out planting with us. We've started to de develop a curriculum around the project as well. Um, well, I should say a lesson where I go into the school ahead of time. I work with the teacher to kind of understand what their objectives are in the classroom, meet some of the science standards. Um, we'll go over a lesson about dunes and sand dune ecology, the importance of dunes, how they help anchor our coastline, how they help combat um, storm surge, how they help protect our, our property that's behind the dunes. Um, and then the next day we'll go out into the dunes and, and actually participate in a restoration project. Thank you. It's not yeah, connected. it's not talking, is it? Right. Okay, thank you for trying, I appreciate it. Um, and so, well, let me get back to the mic then at least. Uh, so, actually, why don't I use this to make sure I hit all my points. Um, so working with school groups has been a very large part of this project. The key planting times are spring and fall. So we kicked off uh, the project on Earth Day of last year, had a window of planting time, and then um, pretty much through the summer did a lot of uh, project planning, in part because planting in the summer is not ideal for the plants. It's a very stressful time in terms of um, sun and heat and uh, <coughs> Um, water and heat stress and it's just a tough time to be on the beach because you know we all love to be on the beach and it's very crowded um, so we did a lot of plant project planning through the or the first spring and summer then in the fall we were out there planting in earnest if you go out and take a look um, you'll see that there's some roped off areas at Hampton Beach State Park those are the areas that we have planted already 
there'll be more of that to come. We're working very closely with a lot of agencies and local partners. Um, we've gone before both the Hampton and Seabrook Conservation Commissions. We're working with them uh, as part of our technical, uh, technical advisory group to make sure that the work we're doing is meeting the needs of the community and aligned with community goals. Um, we're working with the Department of Resources and Economic Development, Division of State Parks, to make sure that all of the work that we're doing at the state park, um, in addition to increasing the resilience of the system and increasing the health of the dunes, it's also allowing it to be a functioning state park. Obviously, we're not gonna plant over their walkways so people can't access the beach. We've worked with them to maintain the primary corridors. We're working with Fish and Game and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure we don't impact wildlife habitat but that we're benefiting it. So there are many, many partners engaged. I haven't even named all of them. I had a slide. <laughs> um, but this has been a very, very collaborative effort so far. And so we're looking as the project goes on, we're constantly asking people, um, who else should we be talking to? Who else needs to know about this project? And so thankfully, Linda was able to connect me with all of you um, as she had come to one of our workshops. And so. Um, I guess that's why I'm here today. One of the, so again, just looking for your assistance in knowing who else should we be talking to. Um, maybe what I'll do too is I can, if you have a website, I'm happy to send you my slides so that people can see the visuals that I was, um, uh, was hoping to show you. But the last piece that I want to mention and possibly one of the more important in terms of Hampton residents is at the state park, we have created what we're calling a common garden. So it's basically a community garden of sand dune plants. And we created it for two reasons. One, to provide plant stock for our own restoration efforts so that when we, the beauty of beach grass, which is the primary plant we have growing in our dunes, is that it grows very, very quickly. And so we planted this garden in April based on data, monitoring data that we've collected by September, where we planted one or two shoots, it had grown to 15, 16, or 17. So we're really increasing our planting stock. So our intention is to use that in our own restoration efforts, but to also make that available to residents who might be interested in planting on their own property. For um, people that abut coastal properties and are looking to um, protect their own property by planting dune grass in front of it. So these, again, would be the people, um, you need sandy soil, so it needs to be the people that abut the, um, the coastline. We're offering this as a free resource to people, and they can work with us, and we'll show them how to plant it, and any little tricks of the trade that we've developed, and this is a resource available to them. Again, the project ends June 2016, so there's kind of a short time frame for this. Ideal planting time starts in March, although March can be a little nasty to be out there planting. So April and May, we'll really want to get going with that. And I'm not quite sure. We don't know the status of the common garden at the state park after the grant ends. We have a, a contract with DRED, Department of Resources and Economic Development, through June 2016, so I'm not sure what happens to the garden after that. We still need to determine it. So um, it will be for landowners interested in obtaining some of the grass to plant on their property it would probably need to happen, you know, in the first first half of this coming year. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking in terms of the people who live um, near the state park, all the residents along that coastal area. Um, can you plant, can they go out in front of the dune in front of the house and plant these grasses? Well, it's a good question. Jay, can I <coughs> it to you in terms of, I mean, technically you would need, would they need a wetlands permit for that? Well, if it's state property, then technically they're going to need to get DES permission, Department of Environmental Services permission to plant on state property. Because remind me, so there's some state property and some town-owned property there, is that right? Right. Okay. And on town property, I would advise anybody to call Ray and I own the conservation coordinator at Town Hall. Just talk to her about what you want to do and find out if a permit is required um, for landscaping, and this would qualify as landscaping, it doesn't always require a town wetland permit. So the best approach is to call Leanne, she can give you good advice and tell you to either go ahead with the project or if some kind of a permit is required, 
she can assist in uh, filling out those permit applications. And my guess is at least for the next six months before our permit with the, actually we our wetlands permit with DES goes beyond the scope of that, but I'm wondering if if the landowner was working in concert with us and it could fall under the guise of our project, I'm wondering if we could talk with the Wetlands Bureau at DES and, ha um, and that planting effort could fall under our permit as well. See, many of these people that I'm talking about are um, seasonal. Mm -hmm. they, they rent their properties, they're not there. Um, there. It would be nice if we had some way to reach out to these people in April and say, you know, because it's one thing to um, to uh, make the area more resilient around the state park, but there are no houses there. And I'm I, talking about people who are sitting on the sand all the way down Concord, Boston, all of these streets. Absolutely. Um, and I will say we, we did that almost strategically, knowing that not knowing the temperature, really, of the communities in which we were working. I mean, um, sand dune restoration up and down the coast is met with very different perspectives and so we strategically wanted our first effort to be on state and town owned land so that we could start to meet people and start the conversations mm -hmm. and our goal is to continue this type of work and certainly to work with the landowners because mm -hmm. I know you know that whole stretch of houses just north of the state park would certainly benefit from a bit more protection so I totally agree with you and what's happening now honestly is exactly what we hoped would happen that we would kind of get in there, start doing the work, start meeting all of you, talking with all of you, and getting the contacts that we need. So what I would say is, if you have any ideas of how we can get in touch with those. I do. You do? The um, real estate people, particularly. OK. Um, well, I well, intended to do this. Anyway, here's thank my you. card. Thank you. Thank you. The land. After the state park, that's town land. So the wet. The United States apartments going up to basically the corner of Dover. And I just want to let you know because I do know some of those people and I've been through this battle. They bulldoze that every year. And it is a fight. <laughs> and I've had people calling me up and. So who bulldozes it? Bulldozes what? The dunes? The town does. The beckoning of, you know, I don't, think um, don't mention these, names. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah. though, John, after the. I have pictures. I've been down there. And I have pictures of waves actually cascading over Teddy's property. Yeah. And going in and flooding it all out. He just takes the rugs out and crap and, <laughs> and But and after <laughs> But after <laughs> But after <laughs> Katrina and after um, the the situation in New Jersey I think people need to be a little bit more proactive, oh, regardless of what they did before that. I totally now agree. I think we have a different situation. Yeah. And uh, I think we need to look Is at that an example of what you meant by different perspectives? <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. I don't know if you know the post, but the, from Haverhill, the next one, which is Bradford, yeah, they're not even in the floods. They're right. I mean, you step off their porch and you're right on the sand. Mm -hmm. They have cellars there, which is amazing. Is Haverhill Town or, or state? Yeah, cellars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, what, Doc Janice's house. Is that is that the, state? The house that's furthest out on the, on the beach has a cellar. Yeah, that, yeah, that's sitting right there. Is that town land or state land? That's um, that would be the state probably. Yeah. You got yeah. that little sewer right. that comes up there. Yeah. So are you talking? You're so okay. So that's the northernmost house right before yeah. you get the White to the house. Well, yeah, yeah. Where the sacrificial dune is now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Jay, would they there be down, by the way. any yes, benefit right. yeah. in the community rating system if this project was successful? One of the things that gets you points in the community rating system is building community resilience. Um, I don't know all the details of exactly what does bring you points in the system, but I would think that if you can demonstrate that you're helping to, in effect, flood proof your community, which is really what the, part of what the community rating system is all about, 
then that's going to hold you in good stead with, with the system. Mm -hmm. So so I would think that strengthening the dunes, making the dunes more resilient so that they can offer the protection that dunes do offer uh, is going to be to the town's benefit um, and hopefully in, in the eyes of the community rating system of FEMA as, as well. Thank you. And it's happening naturally down there because the, the, uh, the I walk the beach quite a bit. The, the first um, dune apartments has started growing over the across the street and it's extending over. In the past, every spring, we would cut that down to the street sign, blow it out under the disguise that it's, it's the walkway for the handicap, we can't do that, blah, blah, blah. The dune's got to be coming down. Um, and then I see where you guys are actually doing it on the, on the, on the uh, north side, I mean the south side of that, and that seems to be working perfectly. You can tell where something's been uh, planted and the dune is actually coming out there. So all the stuff that you're doing is working down there that I see. And I can tell you as a sidebar, a separate project that I'm working on in concert with the crystal geologists at UNH, he's, um, we're going to be, so I'll be back, in a, hopefully in a year, um, to talk about a volunteer beach profiling project where we're going to be taking, engaging volunteers to, um, to look at the change in the beach over time and look at how the beach is building or eroding away to kind of understand the dynamics. And from his preliminary data, the beaches at Hampton and Seabrook over a short period of time. So I'm not making a very broad generalization here over decades or anything, but um, in recent history, the, these beaches are building and see, appear to be stable, more stable than say north of Borsa. We have to lower our beach by about four to five feet every spring. They have to haul it away. They, haul, mm -hmm. they push it back out. Oh, well, yeah. they push it into the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, my house would be on it. There are years I've had to shovel sand and I'm on the other side of Ocean Boulevard. Okay. From my front yard. So we, we get a lot of sand. Yeah. On how we're blowing. Um, and Lucky. there is someone from UNH who was on the beach this past week with this little tri yes. thing with the little thing going up. Yep, and that's who I'm. Going out and measuring the water and all that stuff. So, so I'm working with her advisor. Okay. She's the grad student. Yeah. She's out there on full day. <laughs> so that's a good thing. She's yeah, tough. Good thing. Yeah. Allison, to what extent would planting dune grass on those dunes help to um, uh, slow down their migration? So, um, that's right. So the grass is a very simple yet effective tool at kind of anchoring the sand in place, and that can be both to accrete more sand and build up your dune and protect your structure and honestly to help keep some of the sand from blowing onto your structure and so it won't prevent it but it will slow down the process so what i would say is in the <coughs> area where you've got sand blowing on um on houses we put some plantings in there maybe even put up some fencing to start catching the sand and that's going to be a lot less sand that you have to remove from your property as well and you're afforded some some protection from storms. You know, the, the rule is the bigger the dune, the better. But as we saw from Hurricane Sandy, even communities that had small dunes fared better than those with no dunes. Because when that storm energy is coming, the first thing it hits takes the brunt of the energy, right? And it can be a dune, even if it's a small one, or it can be your house. And so the idea is to put some some barrier up to, to absorb that energy before it gets to your property or your business. Is there a conflict in this planting of the seagrasses with the plovers? Uh, potentially. So we're working very closely with Fish and Game. There are, I've done multiple site walks. There are areas that we're not allowed to plant in because mm. it's over habitat. So yeah. Yeah, and so we're working very closely with them to make sure that we're not impacting plovers in any negative way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah apparently they're a little persnickety. They like a certain density of grass. They like line of sight. They like a certain slope. And so, yeah, they're, they're finicky. But, um, but we have permission from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is what we need under the Endangered Species Act. So we're working with them. And then on the ground, we're working with Fish and Game, which is kind of... Fish and Wildlife Services extension in New Hampshire for clover management. So, Great. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Thank you all so much for your time. I very much yeah. appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for trying to make this work yeah. for me. Now, is there? Did you give John your card for the website's information? 
He's a techie. Because you saw it tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was good, Bob. You know, I was being nice, Bob. <laughs> no, you weren't. I was just. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was good. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right. Any new business, Bob? Uh, in February, we're attempting to have the department heads, to the extent they're available, come to our monthly meeting to explain the Warren articles that they have presented for this year's election, uh, just to give the community some more in input and information. And I haven't firmed it up with all of them. They're kind of busy people, obviously. But now we have indications at least some of them will be here. I'd like to ask Bob about this Boston School meeting with the teacher. Oh, okay. Explain that to me. Um, on February 4th, we're going to meet with the student council at the Marston School. The object of the meeting is simple, to see if we can't come up with the uh, advice, consent, and input of the kids to produce some kind of summer activities for the age group from 8 to 14. Uh, they're just beyond Children's Week, and they're not obviously quite adult, so we're curious in meeting with them to see what ideas they might have for activities. Um, maybe we can get to the point where we'll have a tween fest. Do they, not a, have, do, do they not have anything for them at the um, uh, Dana Martin's crowd. Well, well, that's who's involved. So. Yeah, we're partnering with the rec department on that. She, she's agreed to get involved in a joint activity to see if we can't come up with something at the beach for that at age the beach. group. At the beach. See. For that age group. And Diana Martin has, is, uh, in talking to her, she's all in on it. Okay. Is that something you include as part of Children's Week? No, no, it would be, its, be its own event. They're probably a little too old age-wise for Children's Week and too young. They need a fish and a phone. About all they want to do is play Minecraft on tablets. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to see if we can expand that a bit. Hmm. Is there any particular reason why you picked that age group? Well, I'm, well, I'm not in it. If that's <laughs> no, no, this, of this I am positive. Yeah. No, I, I just thought that was a natural uh, outgrowth of Children's Week. I see. It's the next appropriate age group. When they get up in the high teens, they're off on their own anyway. And they're working, too. They're working, okay. and they have access to cars. It's also an age group that would engage the parents if they came, which is yep. to everybody's benefit, I hope. I think it's a great idea. Okay, thank you. All right, so we we try to have a public workshop where we sit together in kind of a informal setting Please. here to do to go over the budget. Uh, and um, when Thanks. we do that, thank we you. tend to do it open yeah. meeting where anybody in the district who wants to come to that meeting can put in their two cents or just if they just want to listen to see what how we're doing the budget and the date we're looking at is February 2nd at 12:30 we will post that and it'll be in this room so if anybody wants to join us you're welcome and um, I think that's it I have for new business I don't think I have anything else I have anything else I have a question about February 4th do you have a time on that meeting? 8.45. And it'll be oh, at the Marshalls. In the morning? Uh, yes. Steve the kids Steve are dead by there. I won't be there. Okay. Yes. We'll, okay. <laughs> we'll have your proxy vote. Thank you. <laughs> oh, goodness. So 12.30 on the 2nd yeah. for the budget workshop. Okay. All right. We'll move to approval of minutes from December 9th. Page 1. Two and three. I have a motion to approve those minutes. Do you have an extra copy, Joan? Yes, that's what I happened. just gave. You can. Okay, because I, can do. I need a. I, I need one for the file. Okay, I moved. Do you have one of Thank these? You. Well, 
Yes, yes I I got, I've got that. Thank you I very move much. I move to the, approve the minutes as presented. I'll second. All in favor? Okay. Good. Okay, on December 22nd, we had posted that we were having, we, on December 21st, we posted a meeting for December 22nd. At that meeting, we made a motion to encumber the funds for the wall. And the wall, uh, the funds were encumbered for 2016. This was, and the wall to be displayed in 2017. And uh, so that minutes, I'd like to see if we can get a, uh, approve the minutes of December 22nd. Move to approve the minutes of De December 22nd, as okay. written. All in favor? That was good. And public comments. Charlie. Yeah, I just wanted to talk briefly about the uh, state parks, please. Can you come up here? Just wanted to talk briefly about the state park plates. Um, I don't know if it was last month when Nancy was here. And she was talking about putting the bill forward. Well, I guess that's still going forward. It was in the paper this past week. And what it really is, for those that aren't familiar with it, you pay $85, you have the State's Park logo on the plate. But what this is going to do, if you get it, it's going to, bottom line, you're going to get about 82 days. From September 15th till June 15th, weekdays. So you might pick up 10 days in September, 20 in October, 20 in April, 20 in May, another 10 in June, less Columbus Monday and less Memorial Monday. <coughs> You'll be able to get about 82 days that you can park for free. <coughs> Up at every meeted spot in Hampton Beach, I've been working 13 years since 2002. If you pull that off, you've done What took you so long? <laughs> 20 years for bathrooms, so yeah. we're, we're doing good. <laughs> We're getting, we're getting so it, now, when you say Hampton Beach, what about other state parks? Is that you on the website? They've had a, they've had a. They, you can get into all the state parks. They have different things you can do. You can get online. You can go to your town hall and ask. It gets you what's rights. Right now, that plate gets you into what we used to call the state park down across from Uda. <laughs> it's a fifteen dollar fee. That plate has been getting you for the past four years into there for nothing. But what this is, this is allowing you eighty days to. If you say the schools, if you say the season, what the dread calls the season, is April 1st to November 1st, say so seven months, roughly 210 days. What this is going to get you is 82 days that you can park free for that $85 fee. At that point there, you could say, I'll meet you at, you know, Bernie's. I'll meet you at the, at the Ocean Gaming. I'll meet you at McGurk's, so the Sea Catch, or the Boardwalk. Or the purple urchin or the Ashworth, and not worry about getting a ticket on any weekday for about 82 days pre and post season. So I, I'd just like to ask everybody to contact anybody they know in this state that's a legislator or a senator and get this passed. It also says, and this is, it's still in kind of the draft. I got a, I got a little bit of a copy of Brian Wilson, so they're still working on it. it. Probably will, it probably will pass because. Nancy's putting it forward, and Dredd is supporting it. So it should pass. If it passes, it will take effect this uh, July 1st, which would get you into September. So <coughs> September 15th, you'd have all the weekdays till November 1st, and then pick it up in the spring till June 15th. It's a great deal. Can you get a vanity plate with that? Yes, you can. I had it for three years. Can you get years. a piece of that $85? Eight, that $85 goes strictly to Dredd State Parks. I had one for three years. I let it go because they did because of their inaction. If they pass this thing, I'll be getting mine back again. And you, yes, you can get a vanity, you know, whatever. But uh, let everybody know, push it forward. It's a win. It's a great thing. It's, it's going to be a win-win for everybody, the businesses and dread. Great. And you know, in the future, I want veterans to be included in this. I think they're afraid to lose money, but so it's, it was in the paper last week. I said this is a step. You know, maybe next year, the year after, whatever we can get the, we can get when they find out they can actually make money out of this deal. Maybe we'll throw the veterans in, and we'll start, you know, making those shoulder seasons a little bit busier at the businesses. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for It'll all your work. It'll also bring people uptown, down to the beach. 
don't come down because they don't have a place to park. People don't that. like to come down that time of year. That's right. They don't want to come down when there's crowds. They want to come down when That's they have right. a place to themselves to make exercise. Yeah. Great. Anybody else? Kathy. Kathy? Kathy Silver from Blue Ocean Discovery Center. Well, we already sort of mentioned our successful New Year's Eve. We had 350 people there, and we were able to serve them coffee, hot chocolate, and cookies, <laughs> thanks to Bill Murphy and Zarina. And um, we had a great night. It was all, um, I think people were very appreciative. I think I said several times that, you know, that Please thank the Hampton Beach Village District for the fireworks and that the food was all donated. So it was very good. Great. The other thing I want to talk about is like everybody else, we're planning for the summer. June 4th is World Ocean Day, and we are sponsoring a race. There's going to be a 5K race at the beach, and it's the Race for a Clean Ocean. And... You can sign up for it on our website. And all you runners out there and walkers, okay, um, they'll, there's a, that's the first Saturday in June. Yeah. Great. So look forward to that. Going to start where? I'm not, we, we're working on the, the whole plan. And I know it involves the state park. It involves Ocean Boulevard and the beach. But I haven't got the exact route yet. Okay. How far is it? 5K. 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 Yeah. You have to present that to the select one and all of that? Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Not me, thank goodness. No, no, but Somebody I need to be presented. <coughs> oh, yeah, they're, yeah, they're working that. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you working with Amanda? Yes. This? Mm -hmm. It looks like we may be a sister group working with the concept that afternoon. Okay. As well as the same band will perform that evening. I'm not okay. exactly sure what the group I know. We're, she's on the shallow or at the... She's work that yeah. out in her Is that a Saturday? Yes. Is that at the shallow or is it at the... Uh, at the yep. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it makes sense. If they're going to have an act in the afternoon mm -hmm. and we can partner up and do something at night, um, it just makes the, the day more full. More <laughs> will, it, will it be the Continentals? Oh, well, of course. <laughs> You get fireworks that night? Oh. <laughs> no. It actually is a band. I thought this was a neat idea. She'd be looking for a band that would be powered by bicycle power. I thought it was a kind of, I mean, I don't know. Come. Come. Come on. Are you going to pedal? Are you going to pedal? It's all in Keep moving, brother. Keep moving, brother. It's all environmentally friendly. That's yeah. the whole big deal. Uh, we're not burning any coal. But, no. you know, we're, we're still, we're gonna, we're gonna. And we're gonna have chillus on this. Well, you can, yeah. You can do Sorry, it acoustic. All right. So, June 4th. You guys should brush right by that rabbit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. You do that, he'll burn coal. <laughs> all right, closing comments. Anyone? <coughs> no, I don't have any. No. All right, we're gonna adjourn this meeting at 722. 722, thank you.